Like whiskey on the shelf, oil doesn't mark the passage of time. Uh, take this can of castor oil here. It's uh, old enough it hasn't got a barcode on it. It probably puts it in the uh, mid to late 70s and still as fresh as the day it was made. Mm-mm, delicious. Uh, got a beautiful rich golden color. Uh, smells like a simpler time, when real cars came with analog clocks and the next ice age was just around the corner. Of course, I wouldn't know because I hadn't been born yet, but uh, you know if I say this is a libation for a special occasion. Hello and welcome to the channel. Today we're continuing with part two of our engine rebuild series on our uh, trusty 1987 CBR1000. In this video we'll be focusing on the cylinder head and all the little goodies that go with it. Now one such goodie is the uh, cam chain tensioner. Goodie being a subjective term, of course. Now, uh, Honda used to run this style of automatic CCTs, and from what I've read, a lot of people consider these to be prone to failure uh, because of the rattling noise from an overly slack chain. Now, um, digging in, couldn't really find a lot of evidence of situations where this caused the cam chain to become uh, so loose that it uh, caused a catastrophic failure, i.e. your piston coming up into the valve train. But what we got to open is definitely better safe than sorry, so we'll take a look at this component first. Now fitting a manual CCT is a relatively common mod, but uh, to my knowledge, this one hasn't given us any trouble so far, and uh, here's how we make sure. So first, with the CCT empty, uh, locate the tensioner spring and pull back the arm to check the tension. Uh, should feel firm and, and motion should be gradual. Then we fill the chamber with oil and uh, fill up the plunger by pumping the arm a few times. Once it's full, uh, try to yank on it, and it should lock. If it passes this test, then uh, the mechanism itself works. For now, we can reseal the liquid tungsten and put it back on the shelf with the rest of my private reserve. Now we check the guides and other contact surfaces for damage or excessive wear. Uh, if all the parts are good, we can box them up until reassembly. And uh, from looking at these, I don't see any reason to replace any of these components. We can just move right back onto the head itself. Now first thing we'll do is collect the washers and alignment pins from the head, uh, making sure that none have been lost already. This goes for any other loose parts. And um, the first test we'll perform is going to be a simple leak test. So we tilt the head up on its side. Uh, in this case, we've got the exhaust passages facing upwards. And we just splash some solvent into each passage and leave it overnight. Now, if the solvent drains out, you have a leaking valve. And it really is just that simple. If it's a badly blown valve, you'll probably be able to watch the solvent drain out in seconds. Uh, whereas if it's a minor leak, it could take hours before any change is visible. We'll leave this for 24 hours or so to see what we get. Now we check the levels. Counting backwards from 4, we see... Cylinder 4 exhaust seats are almost perfect. Cylinder 3 has maybe a minor leak in either valve A or B. Cylinder 2 has a, a leak on valve B, but not valve A. And cylinder 1 is almost perfect. So now we can dump it out, flip it over, and leak test the intake valves in the same way. Counting up from 1, we see cylinder 1 intake seats have a tiny leak. Cylinder 2 is almost perfect. Cylinder 3 has a minor leak on one or both valves. And cylinder 4 has a leak on valve A, but not B.
Now I wrote this down on a scrap of paper to help me remember the trouble spots when it's time for lapping. Now we remove the boots. These were honestly pretty ugly to remove. And after checking to make sure I could source replacements, I wound up doing some pretty unsavory things to get, uh, to get them off the head. Uh, things which I'm not proud of and which should not be filmed. But anyway, the replacements cost about $15 each. And it's definitely going to be an upgrade over this crusty old 1987 vintage rubber. And uh, really, honestly, I don't think I could have saved them. They were cracking even, even as I took my trim clip to it. In our uh, gentle negotiations, I could see them starting to crack on me there. Now one thing to note is uh, the carburetor boots have an alignment notch to ensure correct orientation on assembly. That's a neat little Honda detail. For now we can move on to the camshafts. Now I've set up my V-blocks and a runout gauge. Uh, this will let us measure runout. Now if you don't have V-blocks, uh, you can take this measurement in the head once the valves have been removed. Um, but I haven't done it that way before so I can't really uh, testify to its efficacy. The basic procedure is to set the needle in the middle of one of the two inner bearing surfaces and to gently rotate the camshaft, watching the needle for movement. Uh, try not to move the camshaft laterally or uh, to bump any of the uh, table or any of the apparatus. Uh, you also want to note that there's a notch on the end of the camshaft, and when that rolls onto the V-block, it will cause the needle to jump. Now, if you do see a sudden jump, um, check the surface for debris crossing the path of the needle. And um, just understand that generally we're more interested in overall trends than momentary bounces. Uh, Runout tolerances are tight at a maximum of one thousandth of an inch, which is, uh, for reference, about a quarter the thickness of a human hair. So um, to give you an idea of how exact that is, but yeah, you know, at any rate, we're using a pretty cheap gauge here, so I'm going to use the word exact with some self-awareness. And honestly, this is one of the most difficult measurements to take, and getting a reproducible re result will take some practice. Uh, it's actually a perfect job for a video camera. If you have the means, uh, film yourself as you do this and review the footage afterwards. That way you can focus on moving the camshaft as gently as possible. And when you re review the video, you can you know, see with some precision at least um, at what position on the camshaft you see a bounce if you do see a bounce or um, if the run out is part of a larger trend. And for reference, I've taken four key frames here to show that even though the dial is jumping around somewhat, the camshaft is within the runout tolerance. Do the runout test for both cams. Now we can measure cam lobe height. Um, now the first step is to ensure that the micrometer is set correctly. Use the gauge rod to ensure that it is calibrated. And um, you'll know it's the correct measurement when it, it kind of wants to drag, but it doesn't want to stick. Once the micrometer is calibrated, then we simply measure the, co the cam lobe at its widest point. And I understand there's a metric and imperial um, measurement listed in the factory service manual. My micrometers are all in inches, so I'm just going to use inches for this video. You want to feel a light drag, and it shouldn't bind up if you rotate the tool around the lobe, because um, you're measuring it theoretically at least at the widest point. Uh, we'd expect to see 1.397 to 1.405 inches at manufacture, uh, with a service limit of 1.395. And every one of these measured at 1.397 or above. And uh, like the runout gauge, this does take a little bit of practice, but I personally find this to be a much easier measurement. Uh, micrometer is a pretty, pretty user-friendly tool, at least as far as precision measurement goes. Uh, now, if you're in a jam, you can use standard calipers for this, but um, they don't lock. So even moving it around the cam, trying to get it in and off to even uh, read the gauge on it uh, can be a little sketchy. You can just introduce some uh, potential for error there. But as I say, they do work. Um, I just prefer micrometers. They give a much more accurate result. Now, for the intake, we'll be looking at 1.402 to 1.410 inches at manufacture with a 1.4 inch service limit, i.e. if it's less than 1.4 inches, we need to replace the cam. Uh, I found that uh, these ones were all around 1.405, plus or minus about a thou, uh, with none measuring anywhere close to service limit. Uh, this makes sense given the good overall condition of the cam surfaces. But um, left me scratching my head whether these had actually come off a bike with 60,000 kilometers on the clock, or uh, if they'd been replaced at some point in the bike's life. 
Um, could also be that the the lubrication system is just really good at preventing uh, wear on these camshafts, which I'd believe. Uh, incidentally, this was this bike came along soon after Honda had their infamous um, problems with the VF. I think it was the VF750. Well, all their V4s essentially had problems with um, oil starvation in the top end, specifically uh, cams and valves. So um, it's possible they overcompensated and just gave this bike a really good oiling system. Now you do want to make sure you set aside a little bit of time to just give these things a visual inspection. Just um, look over the cams, look over the bearing surfaces, um, make sure there's no deep ruts in either the uh, the camshafts or in the uh, cam retainers that attach to the head, as well as the um, journals. And uh, generally speaking, if it's okay to see some polishing, um, but you don't want to see anything, uh, any deep gouges or anything that kind of if you rub your thumbnail across it, if it if it catches your thumbnail, then you might have a problem. Now, in order to measure cam bearing clearance, we need to get our plastic gauge out and uh, make sure it's sized appropriately for the clearances you're measuring. Um, these particular camshafts, the service limit is 0 0.05, well, sorry, 5 one thousandths or 6 one thousandths of an inch. Uh, so we're going to use the red plastic gauge in this case. And you lay it on top of each of the bearing surfaces on the camshaft itself. And then you reinstall the uh, camshaft retainers with cam guides. And torque them correctly to their uh, correct torque values. And then you can simply unbolt them and take a look at the width of plastic gauge. It'll look like a kind of a red smear in this case. And you measure the thickness of the red smear. And um, at its narrowest, we'll tell you, well, where the widest oil clearance is. And where the strip is widest, we'll show you where the oil passages are the tightest, if that makes any sense. And for this head, um, we would need to see uh, five one thousandths or six one thousandths, depending on its location. And from the look of this thing, we're just fine. In fact, this is almost a, a manufactured value. This got to be two one thousandths, maybe. So we're in very good shape with these cam bearing clearances. We're free to move on. So we'll be just fine using these cams for our rebuild. Just a little bit lucky because they can get a bit expensive. So we'll continue with dismantling the head. Uh, we need to remove the rocker spring retainers and um, as well as the guide plates. And those just come out with uh, 10 mil bolts. Note that there are alignment pins that go along with the guide plates. I found a few of these were stuck in there good, so I didn't bother removing those ones. Um, but any of the loose ones, you definitely want to make sure you don't lose those. So to remove the valves, you actually need to remove the four rocker arms on the outside. That would essentially be intake valve 1A, exhaust valve 1A, as well as intake valve 4B and exhaust valve 4B. Uh, those rocker arms need to be removed. So you just loosen the jam nut and you actually have to tighten the inner screw in order to loosen the rocker arm off. Took me a couple tries to figure that out. So to remove the valve itself, uh, you just position your valve spring compressor, whatever fashion it may take. Uh, in this case, mine's pretty ghetto, but it does do the job. And you make sure that you're supporting the valve from underneath and you compress the spring from up top until the uh, cutters are loose. And I've actually used this pick, um, I've magnetized it, so I ran it through one of those little, I don't know, magnetizer things. 
And I find that's a really good method for getting these cotters out, even if you uh, have limited access, which this engine thankfully does not. It's got plenty of room for us to work. Then once the cotters are out, you can release the spring compressor. Um, keep the tool in control, obviously. You don't want parts flying off everywhere. And what we see, we take the uh, upper valve retainer off. There's two springs um, per valve for this particular engine. Then we can just tap the valve stem and remove it from the bottom of the head. And after that point, there's actually two um, two lower spring retainers, which essentially look like washers. They're two different sizes of washers. And so make sure to, to not lose those as well. Now to give you an idea of how I like to stay organized throughout the um, dismantling of the valve train, um, I like to use these egg cartons and um, I label them to which valve they actually correspond to. The nice thing about these is um, you can actually close them up and stack them if you need to. Um, so if I need to put these in a box, if for example I'm mothballing the project or waiting for parts, I can wrap these up, uh, even put some uh, plastic wrap on the outside then put them in a box and I know that when I open them everything will be exactly where it's supposed to be. Now to clean up the valves, I'm actually going to use a method that I've lifted from another YouTuber, uh, a guy named Jaffro Mobile. He's actually prepared a video on very similar subject matter to this and uh, frankly done a much better job of it. So I'll leave a link in the description. Feel free to check it out. Um, as I say, he's, he's just really good at describing uh, what he's doing here. But the short version is we're taking the valve stem uh, we're putting some masking tape on the end of it just to prevent it from marring up. And we're actually going to stick this in a drill. Uh, in this case, we got our cute little Makita cordless here. We're going to move over to the bench grinder where we've got a brass wire wheel. And we're going to uh, spin the valve in the drill while holding up against the brass wire wheel and the bench grinder. And uh, this is a really quick way to clean these things up. It's actually kind of genius. And so long as you don't, you know, you don't want to be spending a ton of time on this. If you're really chewing away at it and um, you're spending five minutes or so per valve, you're probably risking that you'll actually uh, remove too much metal. Because even though these things, they say they don't remove metal or they're, they're safe for removing rust, uh, there's always some metal losses that occur. So just try to keep it moving. Don't uh, stay in one spot for too long. And uh, yeah, repeat the process for all 16 valves. It'll go quicker than you think. So the next step in our valve job is going to be to go back to the cylinder head itself. We need to clean up the seating surfaces, um, well, the seats essentially. So again, I've got a brass wire wheel, uh, in this case just mounted on a little Dremel. And um, again, just kind of a light touch, make sure you're not digging away at the metal too much or risking uh, oblongating any of the holes or, or wrecking it in a way that can be expensive to fix. Now we can clean up the rest of the head. We'll start with the exhaust gaskets, carefully removing each of these with a pick. Uh, they are a single-use item and replacements will come with our gasket kit or can be ordered separately. Cleaning up the mating surfaces with solvent will help to ensure that we don't get any surprise exhaust gas leaks on reassembly. Now back at the top of the head, we can remove any gasket material from the valve cover gasket. Uh, it's a soft rubber-like material, it's Permatex essentially, and I just scraped it off with my thumbnail. Lastly, we can scrape off any material from the head gasket. Now I like to use a razor blade for this, and I consider this to be one of those jobs where perfection is both attainable and desirable. Uh, if you half-ass this, you'll run the risk of oil coolant leaks on reassembly. 
and then you get to redo it with new parts. Now starting with a brand new blade, I hold it at a square or slightly oblique angle and gently run it across the mating surface. Uh, for difficult areas I can hold the blade at an acute angle, but I only do this uh, for stubborn parts, and generally not as a first pass. Use less pressure than you'll think you'll need, especially at the start and end of a pass. Ensure that the blade is perpendicular to the direction of travel, and be careful around, careful around the studs or uh, oil or coolant passages. Razor blades are stainless steel, so they can easily gouge aluminum heads if you're not paying attention. Avoid contact with the corners of the blade, since they're most likely to gouge. And uh, keep an eye on it, replace the blade as soon as you see the edge start to get nicked or chipped. They are cheap and plentiful, so I don't mind using a couple blades for this job. Uh, now if you suspect a high spot, you can use a razor blade at, a, at an acute or sharp angle to try to delineate it. But avoid the temptation to try and carve any of the overhanging metal off with it. Uh, if it's really necessary, flatten the head afterwards once the gasket has been removed. Now I like to stay away from gasket scrapers. Um, in my opinion, they aren't very beginner friendly and I'm not sure if they're much of a time saver even for the experienced tech. Uh, I find that the long handle just makes it difficult to maintain a, a flat, even contact as well as reducing feedback to your hand from the surface. Plus, the sharp angle of approach is just as likely to do harm as good. Be especially careful with the cheap ones that have a really rough grind on the scraping edge. I'm not sure if they have any use whatsoever, and I would never let one anywhere near one of my vehicles. Once all the gaskets have been removed, uh, take a second to blow at any of the debris from various nooks and crannies. Uh, be especially mindful of debris and oil and coolant passages. Uh, these can wedge somewhere where they're not supposed to be in, and essentially like a stroke patient. Uh, they can cause oil starvation, uh, blown water pumps, or other failures down the line. Now cleaning up the combustion chambers is totally optional, since it's just going to get covered with carbon as soon as the engine's put back in service. But if you're going to do it, this is the time. Now we check the head for warpage. For this engine, the service limit is three thousandths of an inch. Get an appropriately sized shim and a straight edge. Simply lay the straight edge horizontally at the front and rear of the head and try to jam the, try to jam the feeler underneath it. Um, you do the same for the diagonals. Lastly, Check the perpendicular warpage on each side of all four cylinders, and this head checked out just fine. Now if needed, I'm told you can flatten these using a surface plate and 400 to 600 grit wet sandpaper, uh, but if it were me, this would be the time I start looking at either replacing the head or having a professional machine job do the work. Now, for one of my favorite jobs, lapping valves. And I'm not being sarcastic either. And we all know the cliche about Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. Not a bad read either. Uh, well, I'm not a real believer in abstract philosophies or any of that mumbo jumbo, but there is something about lapping valves that really resonates as the sort of thing that a person searching for Zen would enjoy, if one were that kind of person. For the rest of us, it's just a nice, quiet job. It takes about half an hour, perfect time to put on an album you haven't heard for a while. Just spend some quality time with your bike. Recapture that intimacy and spark that sometimes get lo gets lost in all the hustle and bustle of daily riding. Spoil your lady. I'm using assembly grease to help the process along. You don't want to do this dry. Uh, motor oil is typically recommended, and I like um, motor oil would be just fine with me. But I like the grease since it's a little bit heavier and has a bright red color. Uh, this is going to make a visible barrier around the guide, which will help to keep the lapping compound from getting into the guides where it can destroy the clearances. 
The other weird thing you'll notice I'm doing is I'm greasing all the valves and installing them all at once. Uh, this is a mental aid for me to ensure that I don't accidentally lap any valves in their incorrect position. Not that I definitely did that the first time I took an engine apart and uh, lapped an exhaust valve where an intake valve should have gone. It's kind of a mistake you only make once. It also makes it a little bit easier to work in an assembly line style, which is perfect for these kind of menial jobs. Now we get our lapping compound and handles. Um, give the compound a stir since it comes thinned with grease and uh, the grease will tend to want to float on surface. And uh, using a clean glove for this, obviously, if it wasn't clear from the footage. Next, suction cup the lapping handle onto one of the valves and remove it to apply the lapping compound to the seating surface. Don't use too much or else you'll risk some uh, dripping into the guides or getting all over the valve face making the handle slip off and leading to frustration. Now lap the valve. Uh, try to keep the handle perpendicular to the valve face uh, just so that pressure is evenly applied to the entire valve seat. Uh, this process is pretty safe, but if you were to really put weight on only one, one side of the valve seat, um, you could theoretically uh, oblongate the hole, um, but that's pretty unlikely. Anyway, just give her, and when you hear the grinding sound start to change to a swishing sound, um, lift it up, rotate it a partial turn, and then give it a light little smack back down into the seat. Uh, the sound should change back to a grinding sound, and you can continue lapping. And within a, within a very short span of time, you're going to realize that the tool is going to want to slip off the valve. And um, this is normal. Happens to everybody. Try to keep it clean. And um, if you need to, you can actually go back and, and clean up the valve face with the brass wire wheel again. Just give yourself a little bit of a uh, better surface. Uh, if not, solvent wipe should work just fine. And uh, as you're working, use your ears and pay attention to the feedback from the tool to determine when the valve's been lapped. Now, it shouldn't take more than a couple minutes per valve, and she'll stop making that periodic squealing sound, uh, and it's going to be replaced with a much smoother metallic swishing sound. Uh, friction will also increase slightly. In practice, it's going to take a little bit of repetition before you start to get the uh, innate sense of when these things are done, so there's no harm in taking your time to get a feel for it. Now, to try and give you an idea of what these things sound like, um, I've lapped the valve on the left and wiped it dry. Listen to the sound it makes when I try to lap it. Now compare that to the unlapped valve beside it. Once the valve's lapped, give the seat a visual inspection. Just kind of turn the valve over in your hand and uh, just make sure there's no, no big chips or, or dings or any other imperfections in the seating surface. And you can measure the seat width using calipers. Now this, this takes a little bit of a practice eye, but um, if you have trouble getting an accurate measurement, you can always use Dicom Blue. Well, Machinist Die, I think it's called. Um, Dicom is the brand name. And you can uh, spray that on the valve seat and then lay it in there and lap it a little bit. And that'll make the seat uh, jump right out on the actual uh, cylinder head itself. So yeah, just repeat this process for all the valves. And once they're lapped in, we can measure the stem outside diameter. Uh, this is another job for the micrometer. Looking at these, we can see the original finish at the top and bottom of the valve stem um, with a slightly worn section in the middle. So we're going to take a measurement in the middle, that most worn um, section of the valve stem. And we'll also take a a measurement at the top of the valve. And uh, the lowest number obviously is going to be our measurement. So service limit for these particular valves is 215 thou, and we're at least half a thou greater than that within the manufactured range. Um, could have probably told this just by looking at it. Um, the fact that you can see the original finish at the top probably means we didn't need to be all that concerned. Now the final step of our head service 
is to measure the free length of all the valve springs. This will help us to rule out fatigue metal within the, um, without, within the springs. And uh, the way we do that, we just use the calipers and uh, just gently ensure you're not compressing the spring with the tool and measure the length of the outside and inner springs. Um, for this head, these measurements were all above service limits. But if any are found to be short, um, as I say, it can be a sign of metal fatigue. So we would need to uh, measure the preload to confirm whether or not the springs needed a replacement. Now as it stands, everything in this head looks really good. Um, seems like it was probably a straightforward problem that was causing our low compression, or at least that's what it seems like right now. Um, cams were all in really good shape. The cam journals were all uh, measured within spec, um, basically manufactured values. So those things were like new, uh, along with the valves and um, the springs were just fine also. So I think we're ready to box, box this up and um, we'll wait until our parts arrive. The next episode, we're going to be looking at the pistons, cylinders, and rings. Based on those, as well as the presence or absence of metal shavings in our oil, we'll be able to decide whether or not we need to open the crankcase. In the meantime, we'll call this a win. Thanks for watching.